from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis. And we look forward to greeting you back in the Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. So as a young Sea Scout boy, we sailed small boats all around San Francisco Bay. Our genius naval architect mate in the Sea Scout ship, he said what the boys really need is a 56-foot brigantine. So we began this big project way back in 1958, a building a brigantine out of an old powerboat. Well, that project never, never got finished. But a few years ago, I heard about somebody who succeeded with an even more ambitious dream. And he is our guest today. With that, I'd like to welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, Alan Olson. Great to have you here. And I'd love to ask you, we're going to hear all about your brainstorm of an idea made real. It's quite a vision that you've brought to life of the Matthew Turner. When was the first inkling that you thought you should be building a square rigger for young people to sail on our beautiful San Francisco Bay? When was the first blink of that idea? Well, first I want to thank you, Ron, for uh, letting me come on and tell a story here. I, you know, I like to tell stories. I had my smaller breaking team and it built in El Viso and launched in 1977. And wait, wait, they have water in Alviso? They did, and they still do <laughs> at high tide. Uh, although it's getting less and less. But at that time, I, and we had an interesting launch, launch then, too. So we sailed out for many years, and uh, we shipwrecked in Mexico over an uncharted rock, and a long story there, nobody was hurt. But uh, we, tried to, we tried to bring the boat up from 145 feet, which we did with uh, bags, lift bags, and those, I had to orchestrate it and in a ponga <laughs> so we did we managed to get her up and they told me i couldn't get down to that depth so i really didn't know what uh the conditions are but the divers who went down who were all volunteers by the by the way and one of them was a, a mexican uh, uh, uh fisherman who first saw the boat and found it down there when we had uh, had to drag for two weeks to find where she was short story is is that we we weren't able to really actually save the boat. We were ground out of money. So we just had to go uh, take her over into the corner and let the air out of the bags and leave. So at that point, I started to think, well, what am I going to do with my time? What am I going to do now? And I said, I don't want to build another boat by myself. I don't want to take that on. Wait, wait, I got to ask. So what kind of boat was this that you sunk and left abandoned in Mexico? Where this a is brigantine. a brigantine. How long? She was uh, 54 feet on the deck and 70 some feet overall. And this is the boat you built in El Viso? That's the boat I built in El Viso. And so, and she went aground, would she go in uh, the Sea of Cortez? Where'd she go aground? No, that was, uh, 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 that was just north of Manzanillo, between Manzanillo, halfway between Manzanillo and, uh, and it's still there, it's not March, <laughs> be careful. Um, <laughs> but, the story, anyway, that's what's prompted me to say, well, I think, I think I'd like to build another boat, but I don't want to own it. I don't want to be the only one who works on it. So that's why I'd, we'd already had a nonprofit that we were using with Stone Ridge with uh, programs from uh, the San Francisco Police Department. And so I had that going and I thought, well, let's just go back and we'll build a big, we'll build, build a tall ship again. So, uh, but as things worked out, money and time and ability to get that all together after a few years trying to do it, decided that, you know, it just wasn't happening. I had a new uh, schooner and I thought, you know, maybe I should just go sailing for a while because building a big ship like that takes lots of money and lots of contacts and things like that. And I didn't, just didn't seem to have that. Although I had a lot of enthusiasm, we had a nice little group working on it, but it didn't seem like we we're making any progress on the money. So anyways, I set that all aside. And, uh, and I kind of left it for a number of years, doing a lot of sailing and this and that. And I kept it in my mind though. I always thought that maybe someday I could figure it out. And I was, I was up at a, where I'd been working for a couple of years then, two or three years there, and up at a, a Buddhist monastery, building temples, uh, which I love doing. Where, what country? Right here, 90 miles north of San Francisco, Odeon. 
O-D-Y-I-N. You can look it up. It's, a, it's an unbelievable place. And I've spent a lot of time up there helping to build uh, temples and art, which I much enjoyed and uh, hope to go back for a few months. <laughs> but the point was, is that I had been working there and uh, we were working late at night and our teacher, a Lama, a Tibetan Lama, uh, he was, we were trying to get some prayer wheels working and he was talking to me and he said, hey, Alan, he said, uh, are you afraid to die? You know, going, what, what, what are you talking about here? I'm, I'm trying to fix these things. You know, you know that's what teachers do. Uh, they ask you, they ask you hard questions sometimes right in the middle to make you think. And I said, well, I don't know, Rinpoche, that, what do I call them? But, uh, I said, I don't know, Rinpoche, how I feel about that. I said, you know, perhaps I'd act, I might welcome it. Or uh, I don't really know. Uh, until the time comes. And then he said something, he said, well, he said, what would you regret? And it came to me like a bolt of lightning. He didn't ask me what it was. He just wanted me to know what I regret. And it was a bolt of lightning. I have to build a ship. That was in 2001. So here we go. It took a while, but now we have that ship. But that is what sparked me to go, wait a minute, I just got to go back. Even though I didn't do it the first time, I'm just going to go give it a try again. But I had learned a lot in the meantime. And uh, uh, so it helped a lot to do that. I did my homework, uh, got the policy back and running again. I had not been working. We got a, a new boat uh, uh, that we bought a used boat. We got it up and running. That's a C word and running programs with that. Getting the organization strong. Uh, and that was all good. Uh, I had brought together when we merged with another in, in the Bay Area to do something about having a, a ship or a tall ship uh, for the young people. And I showed them this prospectus about building the tall ship that I put together. And they kind of, and I said, you know, we're going to merge, but I want you to know this is part of the long range vision for our organization. And they kind of looked at me like, yeah, sure. And okay, okay, yeah, well, that's okay. Yeah, but I really, <laughs> they hadn't really bought in. And so a number of years went by and we got better and better at it. And I didn't, I uh, started thinking about, well, we should really board and went to the board and I said, you know, I understand that you're not ready to do this and I can see why I got, we have a lot on our hands just operating day-to-day -day business with Call of the Sea. So but I'm going to form another nonprofit and it will be solely for the function of building this tall ship. It'll have its own board and we will undertake that. And I said, if and when uh, we're finished, if, if the Call of the Sea is up to it, we will just deed it over to Call of the Sea. If not, we'll operate it with educational tall ship. Well, it turned out, of course, that we were starting to do pretty well with it. And uh, uh, they could see that there was, you know, we, we had a real chance of building this. And so we merged kind of early, merged back together again. So that's kind of the background of that. Crazy idea many, many years ago that San Francisco Bay Area needed its own toll ship with a historical link and the youth of San Francisco Bay needed a chance to get out on, the, on their own local waters and out on the coast and out into the ocean. We felt it would be a good experience for them. We know it's a good experience for them. So that's how this all got started. So here we are today when I met you about five years ago, you didn't have a stick of wood, you didn't have a place to build the boat, you had an article in Latitude 38, and now you're, you're about to launch uh, Matthew Turner. How amazing is that? Well, it's amazing because just like uh, folks like you, Chris, came forward, you got us some wood, other folks came forward with checks, and uh, we just kept going. Well, how important is the sustainability part of the mission of, of the tall ship? And, Very and important. We, we decided early on if we build this ship, we should make it as sustainable as possible because the young people who sail on it, it's going to be their world in the future. And we wanted to show that this generation cares and this is what we're, why we made it as sustainable as possible with the wood, which is all FSC, for stewardship certified. All from of the Big River Forest? From the Big River Forest of, from the Conservation Fund. And they have... 80,000 acres, I believe, up there that they are uh, rehabilitating uh, for selective cutting and to make sure that all of the animals and all the life and, and the, the water is clean and uh, done a wonderful job with that. And so they came to us 
and asked if we needed wood. And we said, of course, <laughs> thank you. And so they selectively cut about 80% of the wood that's in the ship. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so, Alan, um, you got a great percentage of your wood from an outside supplier. Can you tell us who they are and how that worked? We got the wood from uh, the Conservation Fund. They have 80 acres of uh, real nice, uh, you know, uh, forest land that was donated to them to keep it in good shape and to make sure that it was always sustainable, but not just sustainable, but was uh, uh, took care of all the other animals and things there. So it's, it's a very important uh, type of where you get your wood. Uh, it's up in Mendocino and uh, Chris, uh, as I said, he's a Nar sailor and What's his last name? Chris Kelly. Chris Kelly. Which canard does he own? Uh, geez, I don't know the number, but he's been doing it for a long time. Great. And he had read something about us wanting to build a tall ship, and he contacted me and said that we have wood if you need some. And I said, absolutely. Wonderful. So, and we uh, went up there, looked at the forest, and picked out some trees, and he did, and they cut them down, a bunch of them. Uh, and they were about a hundred years old. They weren't the old, old stuff. They don't cut that. Uh, it's all uh, a stewardship cut, the whole force, FSC. It's called, you know, force stewardship certified. And it was very important for us to have that wood, uh, not only because it was given to us, but it came, came from our local coast. We did not want to use any wood that didn't come from the uh, local coast here, the Pacific coast. What type of woods did you use? What were the frames? What, were the, what was the hull made of, et cetera? Well, 90% of it is Douglas fir. And most of that came from that forest. We did get some other uh, FSC, FSC wood from a couple of other suppliers out of Oregon. Uh, and we also got the other major wood we used was Oregon white oak. It's a very good boat building wood. It was used a, a, a lot in the uh, in original construction of the vessels around here. So we basically used the same woods that Matthew Turner would have used to build his ship. So Oregon um, oak, was that for the frames? No, uh, that was mostly for trim issues and things like that where you needed oak, uh, something that could uh, take it uh, more than uh, uh, a Douglas fir. They made all of their, all of the major part of the boats were always Douglas fir because there's so much of it. In fact, you look at most of the fishing, older fishing boats, they're made the same way, all Douglas fir. The name of the ship, Matthew Turner. So he was a pretty cool guy. Tell us when he lived and what made him famous. Well, he started out actually in Ohio, in the river there. And he began there with his father, who had a, a lumber company. And they were cutting lumber. And they then decided to build boats because they had all the lumber. And at one point, uh, in his life, I think his wife had died and he was kind of didn't know what he would do. And he decided he'd go to California and get gold. But he didn't want to, he wanted to get into boating again. He wanted to get a boat. He wanted to do some sailing. Uh, and he didn't build the first one. He had it, he got one in the East, East Coast and sailed it up here. And he went out to get cod. Oddly enough, in the Atlantic at that time, the cod were almost gone. And it was a high, high item, a very valuable item throughout the country, throughout the world. So he, he went up to Alaska and found there was so much cod up there. Nobody, nobody bothered with it. He was able to fill up his ship in a week, came back down and started the cod trade. But he decided he wasn't too happy with that boat. And so he wanted to build his own. So he had, he had uh, someone build it to his specs and he was much happier with that. And he had to, uh, and then they went out and did, did more of the cod fishing up there. Finally, he decided he'd get his own yard. And so he started a yard uh, in San Francisco and uh, at Mission Bay. And he worked there for quite a few years. Uh, like things in San Francisco, it got too expensive to land and too crowded. So he moved up to Nisha and he built 228 ships. That is mind boggling when you think of what that means. His ships were the most famous uh, for their speed and uh, the ability to be able to sail without uh, cargo or without ballast, which is a big thing for uh, sailing boats. When you say without cargo, what do you mean without cargo? 
well, let's say you leave one place and you don't have any cargo, but you got to go to someplace else where you can get cargo and then bring it somewhere else. So you, sometimes you have places where you don't have an advantage. So then generally what they would do is they put ballast rocks in to, to go to the next place. But his boats were designed in such a way that they didn't need that. So that made, that was a big plus. Was there a lead keel in, in the Matthew Turner that you guys built? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, there is a lead keel. Definitely. We did not, we could not do what he did. We had to go by Coast Guard rules, uh, stability, things that were very, very How much is, give, give us some dimensions of the Matthew Turner. How long is it? How heavy is it? What's the beam? What's the draft? She's is a hundred feet on deck. She's 25 feet wide. She draws 10 feet of water. The master are 100, 100 feet off the water. And uh, altogether, she's 132 feet, uh, you know, with spar length. She weighs 170 pound, uh, tons, excuse me. We put in uh, 46 tons of lead that is incorporated into the keel. Uh, which gives a, a, a good re relationship between ballast and uh, overall weight. In fact, she, when we did all of the stability uh, trials on her, uh, tests on her, she had she got great stability, which is what she was dying, designed for, so she could go out voyaging and put up plenty of sail and just be fine. In the 30s, they sent out surveyors and people who understand boat building. The Smithsonian Institute sent them out around the United States to take all the different vessels that were significant and important and to document them so that they could be, have a recording over time. They selected the Galilee. The Galilee was a very famous boat because it was still around, uh, which many of them weren't, and it had uh, a long life, uh, uh, both as a, uh, a boat that went first built to go to Tahiti uh, and I can go into that a little later, but it was, it was still operating uh, up until the very end into the 30s. So they took all the dimensions off of it and they did the drawings. So we knew exactly. So that's how we were able to choose a vessel from Matthew Turner. And the Galilee was important because it was built in 1891 to go to, 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 go to Tahiti and those islands. The reason was that during that period, uh, San Francisco was growing so fast that they didn't have any fruit. So there was actually scurvy in, in the area and they had to get some fruit. So they, they took, other vessels had gone down there and got fruit, but couldn't get it back fast enough because they weren't fast. Well, Matthew Turner figured he could do that and he could do that with the Galilee. And it was very successful. He built two more to go back and forth to Hawaii. He uh, had a whole business down there. Uh, going on on all, many levels. So he Matthew that Turner, there. the boat builder, starts making a living uh, importing fruit for the ships he's building. That's right. Just as he did with the uh, cod trade in up in Alaska area. He had other things going on, but he, uh -huh. mostly he was building ships. So the Galilee, i give you a little background on that. It was actually ended in Sausalito. It's life. It, it ended up uh, being uh, docked to put on the mud at that time. And people lived on board it. And finally, little by little, it deteriorated. And uh, if anybody's noticed it, at Fort Mason, the Kent transom was cut off about 30 years ago or 40 years ago and put up there. Uh, but little by little, it just went away. Uh, we cut off the, we didn't, but they came and cut off the bow and they put that, brought that up to Benicia. Uh, not much left of that. This is the Matthew Turner, the 100 foot brigantine, was it built on the lines of Galilee? It was built, it was, we, we were as say, inspired by the Galilee. And so we incorporated the design features that Matthew Turner had both in the rig and in the hull and all and, and issues like that. But as far as construction techniques, we were quite different. We used a lot of the uh, classical stuff from the 19th century, which would be uh, how we uh, are planking, for instance. But so much of our stuff is also from the 21st century. Uh, laminations, a uh, hybrid uh, regenerative uh, uh, power system, propulsion system. So uh, there was a lot of difference between it. The biggest issue was a size of a boat that we could handle well for what our job would be, and that would be school ship. And and so we brought her into a certain size, which is 
smaller. And I saw the knuckles when you were constructing it. You had a couple of open houses and I went to one or two of those and I couldn't believe the size of some of the frames. I mean, some of the frames were like, they seemed like they were 10 inches in diameter, maybe a foot. That seemed really big. Did you make them bigger because, because they were uh, dug fir instead of oak? Or is that the size they would have been no matter what you made them out of? Pretty much the size what we would have made them out of. They weren't quite that big. They were eight inches deep. Uh, and six inches uh, wide. Yeah, they were just, they, they boggled my mind. My 84 year old youngster has like, you know, when we, the floors are like only three inches wide, four inches wide. And I, I was just mind boggled by how sturdy it looked like the Matthew Turner was. My name's Alan Olson. I'm here helping to build a tall ship, the Matthew Turner Brigantine. Uh, we're calling it the Matthew Turner because he's a very famous uh, designer and builder late 19th century. The ship is a brigantine, which means she is has square sails on her foremast. She's two-masted. Uh, these, these brigantines were very famous for their speed and ability to go upwind. They uh, set many records that uh, some not yet broken. Uh, he built 228 ships. Uh, started in the Mission Bay with his shipyard and then moved to Benicia and he built until 1910. Uh, the boat is 100 foot on deck, 132 feet overall with the spars. Uh, the mast is 100 feet off the water. Uh, she draws 10 feet of water to float. She's 25 feet wide and 175 tons. Uh, we chose to build the boat out of the original type materials. Majority of the wood was donated to us by the Conservation Fund. It comes from the Mendocino Coastal Forests. One of the things we've done differently is that we are doing laminations and some of the structural members. Uh, it's, a, it's a much stronger uh, approach and it also will last much longer because the laminations tend to stop any of the water seepage or any rock that might start to go through. Most of the boat is traditional. Uh, the planks are going to be steam bent, just like they were at the time they were being built. Uh, so so th some things will be the same. Yes, but uh, the basic shape, the basic materials, and the concept is from a late 19th century brigantine by Matthew Turner. Uh, we have shipwrights. Uh, we have uh, uh, Franz Bacon, uh, uh, who is our head shipwright now. We have many volunteers. In fact, the majority of the people building this boat uh, are volunteers. The people are working here, I really enjoy it. They come on a regular basis, many of them. Some have other jobs and other responsibility, so it's not necessary that people be full-time. You can come down to the site here in Sausalito at 2330 Marin Shipway uh, and just say hello and see what we're doing. Then we can sign them up and schedule them to come to work. The reason we're building this boat it's not just because it's historically valuable, but because we wanted something to uh, expand our program with on Call of the Sea. Call of the Sea now operates the schooner Seaward. We do over 5,000 kids a year on it, uh, both here on the bay and out in the ocean. We need uh, more, more capacity, and so that's why we're building the Matthew Turner. It's a great atmosphere. If you want something to do and make make something of a difference to actually build something. It'll be around for generations. It means something to the Bay and to the, uh, the youth of the Bay. Come on, give us a hand. We also, of course, need funding. Uh, this is an expensive proposition. We have had some funding. We are now at about half of our funding uh, that we've collected, but uh, it just keeps running out. So please consider uh, joining in as a sponsor.
A few questions. How did you structure the volunteers who worked on the ship? Somebody made a schedule. Somebody else would uh, keep track of uh, who was, you know, able to do milling and who could run the router and who could run the saws. What was the structure of the volunteer carpentry shop, if you will? Well, <clears throat> the structure was basically we had people who were, you know, had more uh, more familiarity with either a boat construction or uh, carpenters, or in some cases they were. Uh, uh, building contractors. So they often had some more, uh, they, 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 we put them onto a job and say, okay, we want you to take care of this particular thing. Here's some volunteers. Uh, they were volunteers themselves. They, how often can you come? We, we get a schedule. It was amazing how many would actually come and work every day. And uh, they just, Fortunately, many of them were in a position, they were older, they were retired, they had skills, but they were still healthy. And so for them, it was just, you know, and their wives, it was get them out of the house and go to work over there. And they, they loved it. <laughs> was a whole, how many volunteer hours over what period of time? Well, uh, at the end of the building of it, I think when we finally got our license from the Coast Guard, it was over 200,000 hours. And it's still counting. It's still counting, uh, but it, of course there was a big cruise at that time, so the numbers went up pretty quickly. Over how many years? How long did it take from start to finish? Well, we laid the keel in in uh, 2013. We launched in 17, 2017, and we uh, began sailing in 19, and we got our Coast Guard certification. I think late 19 or early to, uh, 2000. Mm -hmm. so, What's the, how many crew does it take to sail it? Well, officially, if we are under 12 hours, uh, seven. If we're over 12 hours, we have to have a second license, and so it's eight. So describe the crew. Well, uh, we usually have a larger crew. We have some, uh, of course, we have a lot of volunteer crew that love to come up and sail. They know the boat. They help build the boat. So they know the rigging because they worked on that. So we, we sail with about 10. And uh, so there's a lot of things they do. I mean, they have to basically, the captain's going to call the shots and uh, mate will help. Uh, there will be, uh, uh, then we have a uh, head of the deck who call, calls out to each of the different stations and what they're doing and giving them the timing. So there's a lot to it. It's kind of fun to see the process when you're on board uh, to see how a tall ship runs and people up and down the rig. Uh, I mean, that's common. They're up there to set sails and bring them in. So it's pretty fascinating to see all that uh, operating. And they have to know where everything is. Uh, you have to come up in the middle of the night. You have to do something. Uh, you need to know where it is. So when we train, we usually train them for specific areas so they don't have to know everything. It would be too much for them to learn in the beginning. The same when we do it with a school ship. We will have them, uh, you know, trained on certain aspects of it and during their time on board. They will learn that. They have more time on board. They'll probably learn more. So uh, uh, that whole process is pretty fascinating to watch. It's not unlike a complicated racing boat, really. It's just that there's more stuff and it's bigger. So what about accommodations? Talk about the accommodations. How many crew can you keep uh, overnight, et cetera? How many bunks? We have 39 bunks. Now, some of the bunks are like in the captain's and uh, mate's cabin, there's two bunks and whether they got their friend there or their girlfriend there, uh, it would only be, so we're down to uh, uh, 37. And then there's other reasons. So we probably would be running with about 25. Uh, the rest would be, uh, would have, uh, Eight, eight operating crew would have at least one, uh, you know, a cook, uh, and we would also have one or more educators. So it would leave us with about 20, 25 kids who would be on it for overnights. Uh, or I should say students, because we say kids, but we not, our, our mission does not uh, to, uh, to kids. It, students we call them students they could be old or young so that's one thing we want to make sure that everybody would have an opportunity to be on this ship and learn something but we primarily are after the youth that's our main focus what's the power plant well that's pretty interesting we're the only ship like this uh the sailing ship nobody's 
uh, at this point have, have attempted this. But what we have is electric motors, two electric motors uh, that drive the propellers. And they're, of course, they're, one of the reasons we have two is because, uh, first of all, the Tricoastal Marine, which is the company that does the design work, did, does not does only does uh, twins because they, by the time you knock out the, uh, uh, for a single by the rudder, by, by the stern post, you, you don't have any bite in the water. It's just too much junk back there. So they want, the, they want the propellers in clean water, which is exactly what we want because we are regenerating power when we sail. Okay. So these are not folding props. In other words, they're no folding props because they, they turn when you're rolling through the water, when you're sailing through the water, you're using the prop to generate electricity and store it in batteries. That's true, although there are folding props, which will in fact uh, catch and can be used in this type of operation. And I, there was a lot of different tests done on them and I looked at them and they were, they were better in some circumstances, but they were like sixteen or $18,000 a piece when we had to get one. And I said, let's just get some regular props and we'll think about the other ones later. And so we got three bladed, uh, they're kind of thin blades, but we got them uh, with a greater uh, diameter than would normally be needed. They were 36 inches. In fact, that would both be uh, powerful uh, in propulsion and backing up, and it would also be powerful for regeneration. And it turned out to be that case. At eight knots, we can generate eight kilowatts. And as we go up in knots, we can generate much more. I mean, at 12 knots, we'd probably be at, I don't know, 15, 16, uh, 100 uh, kilowatts. So you gotta feel pretty good. You're pretty green footprint. You're not diesel and you're sail and electric, self-generated. We are uh, We are not, we, we don't use diesel, we use a, uh, another product uh, that is, uh, comes from organic. It's an organic diesel. And we do burn that. So yes, we are, but what our needs are much lower considering what we would have to do. Even those boats I mentioned that were first made, they burned less than ha or about half as much fuel as the ones doing the same job uh, that had uh, strictly just diesels. So you get a certain uh, uh, efficiency because when the when the batteries charge, they'll take over three times their discharge rate, and they can charge up uh, very quickly with those uh, big diesels. Those diesels are three hundred uh, 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 horsepower each, and there's two of them. They're Cummings, and so they produce a huge amount of electricity. They just run up to the most optimum speed, the best energy. Uh, use and that's the rate they charge with. We're pleased with how it all came out. It came out as pretty much as we'd hoped. So let me see if I understand you. You do have diesel engines, but you feed them with bio uh, grown fuel. Is that right? Yes, yes. Bio and you use those to augment the electricity, which you otherwise self generate with the prop. Right. Right. And what's the, how much storage can you have of electricity on the boat? Well, considering both of the uh, battery banks, uh, it's 700 kilowatts. So you can store 700 kilowatts. Yeah. Okay. And just so somebody would know, if you had 700 kilowatts, and you need to go some distance. Would you cruise at like four knots or something? And what would your cruising range be then? Just trying to get some Five cruising. Five knots is fine. It'll last for quite a few hours. You might get six hours out of it at, at those low, low speeds. Gotcha. Uh, okay. So six hours times four knots. So six hours times four knots. So you can go six times four. Okay. And then something's got to happen and they'll, they'll generators will come back on. What's the longest trip you guys have taken? Well, half moon bay. <laughs> so far, half moon bay. What are your plans? Where are you going to take her? Well, we have all kinds of plans. I mean, Hawaii is one. Mexico is one. We're probably going to do, uh, uh, at some point, uh, do the trip that went down to uh, the Tahiti that the uh, original Galilee did. So we have a lot of ideas about where we would go. But one of the things we want to make, we do really want to have a strong presence in the Bay and along the coast. Uh, so we'll be gone only part time from, from the Bay, uh, particularly in the winter. I mean, going to Mexico is the obvious thing in the winter. And, and we're looking at possibly going on the uh, Pacific Cup this coming up year in 22. So what's the days per year of programming you have on the boat? I see you're out a lot. 
I see you out yeah, all the time. Well, right now we're going out a couple of times a day, uh, uh, four days a week, sometimes only once a day, uh, four times a week. So that's that'll be different when we do the, uh, longer trips, of course. But we would like to uh, operate probably about 10 months out of the year. Usually that's practical with haul outs and this and that, and the, you know, come fall or late fall and winter. Uh, so we figure about 10 months of operation. What's the most weather you sailed her in? Oh, I guess 30, 35 knots or something like that. You know, the regular big winds out on the bay. She doesn't seem to care. I've sailed her a couple of times and she she seems pretty pretty stable. You could take her down the coast this next year. When are you thinking you're going to take first longer trip? Monterey Bay uh, for now. That would be our first uh, destination outside of the Bay Area here. Uh, and then the, the other one would be uh, further south. Uh, thinking about going down to um, Dana Point. There's some things going on down there that might be able to work with them. Uh, but finding business is something else. You know, you got to find business down there and that's not easy. So we're partnering, we look to be partnering with different organizations down there that would like a tall ship to come down for a few weeks and do programs. So uh, Newport Beach, uh, looking forward to doing that. So we're, we're trying to get all that stuff uh, up and running. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities in, in, in Monterey. So, uh, but our, of course, our biggest trip we're going to be once we do the Hawaii trip. That is in our future. We're hoping it's this year, or I should say uh, 2022. So Alan Olson, creator and inspiring leader of the Matthew Turner 100 foot on deck tall ship sailing in San Francisco Bay. It was great to get the inside story from you on building the boat. Uh, as a sailor, I see her out all the time and I've enjoyed sailing on her a couple of times. Uh, really, really fun. A brigantine. Uh, for those who um, might remember, a brigantine's got a square uh, mass forward and four and a half sail aft, so you can go up the breeze in this boat. She was racing near us in the Master Mariner earlier in this year, and people in your boat were looking, we were looking back and forth between Youngster and your boat, and it was just fun to see her haul in the mail. It was great. She was, she's looking great on the bay. Thank you very much, Alan Olson. It's been a pleasure having you as our guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. So I'd just like to add, uh, we have open uh, sales uh, on weekends often on Friday nights. Just go call to the sea.org. Check it out. Got to put in my little <laughs> commercial. It's really great to see a dream come true. Thanks so much for sharing your story with the Wednesday Yachting Lunch. Thank you, Ron, for asking me. Uh, my pleasure.